The Complete Visions of and Catherine Emmerich Joseph returned from Bethlehem with five priests and a woman whose services were necessary on such occasions. They brought with them the circumcision stool and an octangular slab with all that was needed for the ceremony. All this was placed in order in the passage. The stool was hollow and formed a chest, which could be taken apart, thus affording a kind of low seat with a support on the side. It was covered with red. The circumcision stone was, perhaps, over two feet in diameter. In the center was a metal plate under which, in a hollow of the stone, were all kinds of little boxes containing fluids. These boxes were in separate compartments, and at one side lay the circumcision knife. The stone was laid upon the little stool which, covered with a cloth, always stood on the spot upon which Jesus was born, and the circumcision stool was placed next to it. That evening a repast was spread under the arbor at the entrance to the cave. A crowd of poor people had followed the priests, as is usual on such occasions, and during the meal they were continually receiving something both from the priests and from Joseph. The priests went to Mary and the child, spoke with the mother, and took the child in their arms. They also spoke to Joseph about the name the child was to receive. They prayed and sang the greater part of the night, and circumcised the child at daybreak. Mary was very much troubled, very anxious about it. After the ceremony, the infant Jesus was swathed in red and white as far as under the little arms, which also were bound and the head wrapped in a cloth. The child was again laid on the octangular stone, and prayers recited over it. If I remember rightly, the angel had already told Joseph that the child should be called Jesus, and I have a faint recollection that one of the priests did not at first approve the name, consequently, they still continued in prayer. Then I saw a radiant angel stand ing in front of the priest, and holding before him a tablet like that above the cross, upon which was inscribed the name of Jesus. I saw the priest writing the name upon a scrap of parchment. I know not whether he or any of the others saw the angel, but deeply moved, he wrote the name under divine inspiration. After that, Joseph received the child back and handed it to the blessed virgin who, with two other women, was standing back in the crib cave. Mary took the weeping child into her arms and quieted it. Some shepherds were standing at the entrance of the cave. Lamps were burning, and the dawn was breaking. There was some more praying and singing and, before the priests departed, they took a little breakfast. I saw that all present at the circumcision were good people. The priests were enlightened and later attained salvation. Alms were distributed the whole morning to many poor people who presented themselves. Afterward followed a crowd of beggars, filthy, black creatures, very repulsive to me. They carried bundles and, coming up from the valley of the shepherds, passed the crib as if going to Jerusalem for the celebration of a feast. They were very boisterous, cursing and scolding horribly, because they did not receive by way of alms as much as they wanted. I do not know exactly what was the matter with them. During the ceremony of circumcision, the ass was tied further back than usual. At other times, it stood in the crib cave. During the day, I saw the nurse again with Mary attending to the child. That night, the child was very restless from pain. It cried, and Mary and Joseph tried to soothe it by carrying it up and down the cave. While reflecting upon the mystery of the circumcision, I had a vision. I saw two angels with little tablets in their hands, standing under a palm tree. Upon one tablet were pictured various instruments of martyrdom, of which I remember one, a pillar which stood in the middle. On it was a mortar, which had two rings. On the other tablet were letters denoting the seasons and years of the church. On the palm tree and as if growing out of it, was kneeling a virgin, her flowing mantle, or veil, for it was fastened over her head, floating around her. In her hands was a heart upon which I saw a tiny, shining child. I saw an apparition of God the Father drawn near to the palm tree, break off a heavy branch that formed a cross, and lay it on the child. Then I saw the child raised, as it were, on the cross, and the virgin reaching the palm branch with the crucified child on it to God the Father, the heart alone remaining in her hand. On the evening of the following day, I saw Elizabeth on an ass and accompanied by an old servant, 
coming from Judah to the cave. Joseph received her most cordially. The joy of Mary and Elizabeth was extremely great as they embraced each other. Elizabeth pressed the child to her heart. She slept in Mary's cave next to the place in which Jesus was born. Before the sacred spot stood a stool upon which they often laid the child. Mary told Elizabeth all that had happened to her, and when Elizabeth heard of their difficulty in getting a lodging on their arrival in Bethlehem, she wept heartily. Mary gave her all the details of the infant Jesus' birth. I remember hearing her say that she had been in ecstasy ten minutes at the time of the Annunciation, that it appeared to her as if her heart had grown double its size and that she was filled with unspeakable happiness. But at the child's birth she had experienced an intense longing. She felt while kneeling that she was upheld by angels, and as if her heart was broken asunder and one half taken from her. She had also been ten minutes in ecstasy at the time of the birth. She had been conscious of an emptiness within her, a longing after something outside of herself. Suddenly a light shone before her, and the figure of the child seemed to grow before her eyes. Then she saw it moving and heard it crying and, coming to herself, she raised it from the rug to her breast, for at first seeing it environed with glory, she had hesitated to take it up. Elizabeth said, Thou hast not given birth in the same way as other mothers. The birth of John was sweet also, but it was not like that of thy child. Once I saw Elizabeth with Mary and the child concealing themselves toward evening in the side cave. They remained there the whole night, for visitors from Bethlehem were approaching by whom they did not want to be seen. The Jewish women do not leave their children long without other nourishment than the breasts, and so the infant Jesus was fed in those first days on pap made of the sweet, light, nutritious pith of a certain rush-like plant. As in the temple at Jerusalem, the holy feast of the Machbees began at this time, it was also celebrated by Joseph in the crib cave. He fastened three lamps with seven little lights on the walls of the cave, and, during a whole week, lighted them morning and evening. Once I saw in the cave one of the priests who had been present at the child's circumcision. He had a roll of writings from which he prayed with Saint Joseph. It seemed to me that he wanted to find out whether Joseph kept that feast or not. I think, too, that he announced to him another, for a fast day was near at hand. I saw the preparations for it in Jerusalem. Food was prepared the day before the feast, the fire was covered, several work was put aside, the doors and windows were hung with tapestry, and often sent servants with gifts of provisions and utensils, all of which Mary soon distributed to the poor. Once and sent a beautiful little basket of fruit with large, newly blown roses stuck in among it. The pink roses were paler than ours, almost flesh-colored, and there were some yellow, and some white. Mary was very much pleased, and placed it beside her. And now came in herself, accompanied by her second husband and a servant. The infant Jesus stretched out his little arms to her, and great was her joyful emotion. Mary gave her a full account of all as she had done to Elizabeth. They mingled their tears together, pausing at times to fondle the infant Jesus, and had brought with her many things for Mary and the child, coverlets, swathing bands, etc. Although Mary had already received so many things from her, yet the crib cave was still quite poor in appearance, since whatever was at all unnecessary was given away at once. Mary told them that the kings from the east were approaching with rich gifts, and that their coming would attract much attention, and therefore resolved to go and stay with her sister, who dwelt at some hour's distance, and to return after the departure of the royal visitors. Then I saw Joseph set to work to clear out the crib cave as well as those in its vicinity, in order to prepare for the arrival of the kings whom Mary and Spirit had seen coming. He went also to Bethlehem to make the second payment of taxes and to look around for a dwelling, for he intended to settle in Bethlehem after Mary's purification. After the departure of the kings, the holy family went over into the other cave, and I saw the crib cave quite empty, the ass alone still standing there. Everything, even the hearth, had been cleared away. I saw Mary peaceful and happy in her new abode which had been arranged somewhat comfortably. Her couch was near the wall, 
and by her rested the child Jesus in an oval basket made of broad strips of bark. The upper end of the basket, where the head of the infant Jesus lay, was arched over with a cover. The basket itself stood on a woven partition, before which Mary sometimes sat with the child beside her. Joseph had a separate space at a little distance. Above the movable partition, there projected from the wall a pole to which a lamp was suspended. I saw Joseph bringing in a pitcher of water and something in a dish. But he did not go any more to Bethlehem for necessaries. The shepherds brought him all that he needed. And now I saw Zachary coming for the first time from Hebron to visit the Holy Family. He wept for joy as he held the child in his arms, and recited, with some little changes, the canticle of thanksgiving that he had uttered at John's circumcision. He spent the following day with Joseph, and then took his departure. Many persons going up to Bethlehem for the Sabbath called also at the crib cave. But when they no longer found Mary there, they went on to the city, and now came back to the mother of God. She had been eight days with her youngest sister, who had married into the tribe of Benjamin. She lived about three hours' distance from Bethlehem, and had several sons who later became disciples of Jesus. Among them was the bridegroom of Cana. Anna's eldest daughter was with her. She was taller then and then looked almost as old. Anna's second husband also was with her. He was older and taller than Joachim, was named Eliud, and was engaged at the temple where he had something to do with the cattle intended for sacrifice, and had a daughter by this marriage, and she, too, was called Mary. At the time of Christ's birth, the child may have been from six to eight years old, by her third husband, and had a son, who was known as the brother of Christ. There is a mystery connected with Anna's repeated marriages. She entered into them in obedience to the divine command. The grace by which she had become fruitful with Mary had not yet been exhausted. It was as if a blessing had to be consumed. Mary told them all about the kings, and she was very much touched at God's bringing those men so far to adore the child. She was filled with emotion on seeing their gifts, upon which she looked as expressions of their adoration. She helped to arrange and pack them, and she also gave many of them away. Annas' maid was still with Mary. When in the crib cave, she stayed in the little cellar-like cave to the left, and now she slept under a shed that Joseph had put up for her just in front of their present abode. And then her daughters slept in the crib cave. I saw that Mary let and take care of the child Jesus, a favor she had not granted to anyone else. I saw something that very much affected me. The hair of the infant Jesus, which was yellow and crisp, ended in very fine rays of light which glistened and sparkled through one another. I think they curled the child's hair, for they twisted it over the little head when they washed it. Then they put a little cloak around him. I always saw Mary, Joseph, and in full of devout emotion for the child Jesus, but their expression of it was quite unaffected and simple as is always the case among holy, chosen souls. The child displayed a love in turning toward its mother such as is by no means usual in young children, and was so happy when she was nursing the child. Mary always laid it in her arms. The king's gifts were now hidden in the cave in which Mary had taken up her abode. They were in a wicker chest placed in a recess of the wall and perfectly concealed from sight. Anna's husband with her daughters and maids soon returned home, taking with them many of the royal gifts, and was now all alone with Mary and Joseph, and she remained until Eliud and the maid came back. I saw her and Mary weaving or embroidering covers. She slept in the cave with Mary, but separate. There were again in Bethlehem, soldiers seeking in many houses after the king's son newly born. They especially importuned with their questions a noble Jewish lady who was in childbed, but they went no more to the crib cave. It was now reported that only a poor, Jewish family had been there, but of them nothing more could be learned. Two of the old shepherds went to Joseph, two of those that had first gone to the crib, and warned him of what was going on in Bethlehem. Then I saw Joseph, Mary, and then with the child Jesus making their way from the cave to the tomb under that large cedar tree beneath which I had heard the kings singing one evening. 
It was distant from the cave about seven and a half minutes. The tree stood upon a hill at the foot of which was an obliquely lying door opening into a passage that led to a perpendicular door which closed the entrance to the tomb. The shepherds often stayed in the forepart of it. In front of the tomb was a spring. The tomb cave itself was not square, but rather rounded in form. At the upper end, which was somewhat broader, something like a scallop stone coffin stood on heavy supports upon a foundation of stone. One could see between it and the coffin. The interior of the cave was of soft, white stone. I saw the Holy Family entering it by night with a covered light. In the cave that they had vacated nothing now was to be seen which could attract notice. The beds had been rolled up and taken away, as well as all their household effects. It looked like an abandoned dwelling place, and carried the child in her arms, Joseph and Mary at her side, while the shepherds led the way as guides. And now I had a vision, but I do not know whether it was seen by the Holy Family or not. I saw around the child Jesus in the arms of, and a glory made up of seven angelic figures entwined together, and leaning one upon the other. There were, besides, many other figures in this aureola, and on either side of Anne, of Joseph, and of Mary, I saw figures of light supported by them, held up, as it were, under the arms point one passing through the first entrance, they shut it, and went on into the interior of the tomb cave. A couple of days before Annas returned home, I saw some shepherds entering the tomb cave and speaking to Mary. They told her that government officials were corning to seek her child. Joseph hurried off with the child Jesus wrapped in his mantle, and I saw Mary, for half a day perhaps, sitting in the cave very anxious and without the child. When Eliud with Annas made Karn again from Nazareth to take him home, I saw a very beautiful ceremony celebrated in the crib cave. Joseph had taken advantage of Mary's withdrawal to the tomb cave, and with the help of the shepherds had adorned the whole interior of the crib cave. It was festooned with flower garlands, both walls and roof, and in the center stood a table. All the beautiful carpets and stuffs of the kings that had not yet been removed were spread over the floor and hung in festoons from the walls. A cover was spread on the table, and on it was placed a pyramid of flowers and foliage that reached to the opening in the roof. On top of the pyramid hovered a dove. The whole cave was full of light and splendor. The child Jesus in his little basket cradle was placed upon a stool on the table. He sat upright as he had done on the lap of his mother at the adoration of the kings. Joseph and Mary were standing on either side of him. They were adorned with wreaths, and they drank something out of a glass. I saw choirs of angels in the cave. All were very happy and full of emotion. It was the anniversary of Joseph and Mary's espousals. When the celebration was over, I saw Anne and Eliud going away and taking with them on two asses what still remained of the king's gifts. The holy family immediately set about preparing for their own departure. Their household effects had steadily diminished. The portable partitions and other pieces of furniture made by Joseph were now bestowed upon the shepherds, who removed them at once. I saw the blessed virgin going twice by night to the crib cave with the child Jesus and laying it on a carpet on the spot upon which it was born. Then she knelt down at its side and prayed. I saw the whole cave filled with light as at the moment of the birth. It was now entirely cleared out, for and on reaching home had dispatched two of her servants to get whatever the holy family would not need on their journey. I saw them returning with the two asses on which they rode laden with goods. The cave to which the holy family had removed, as well as the crib cave, were now quite empty. They had also been swept out, for Joseph wanted to leave everything perfectly clean. On the night preceding their departure for the temple, I saw Mary and Joseph taking formal leave of the crib cave. They spread the deep red cover of the king's first over that spot upon which the child Jesus was born, laid the child on it, and kneeling beside it prayed. Then they laid the child in the crib and again prayed beside it, and lastly, on the place where it had been circumcised where, too, they knelt in prayer. Joseph had caused the young she asked to be pawned among his relatives, for he was still resolved to return to Bethlehem and build himself a house in the valley of the shepherds. He had mentioned his intention to the shepherds, 
saying that he would take Mary for a while to her mother, that she might recover from the hardships undergone in her late abode. He left all kinds of things with them. Before the break of day, Mary seated herself on the ass, the child Jesus on her lap. She had only a couple of covers and one bundle. She sat upon a side seat that had a little footboard. They started to the left around the crib hill and off by the east side of Bethlehem unperceived by anyone. I saw them at midday resting at a spring that was roofed in and surrounded by seats. A couple of women came out here to Mary, bringing to her little mugs and rolls. The offering that the Holy Family had with them was hanging in a basket on the ass. The basket had three compartments, two contained fruit, and in the third, which was of open wickerwork, were doves. Toward evening, when about a quarter of an hour's distance from Jerusalem, they turned and entered a small house that lay next a large inn. The owners were a married couple without children, and by them the holy travelers were welcomed with extraordinary joy. The house laid between the brook Cedron and the city. I saw Annas' man's servant and the maid stopping with these people on their journey home, at which time also they engaged quarters for the holy family. The husband was a gardener. He clipped the hedges and kept the road in order. The wife was a relative of Johanna Chusa. They appeared to me to be Essenians. The whole of the next day, I still saw the Holy Family with the old people outside Jerusalem. The Blessed Virgin was almost all the time alone in her room with the child which lay upon a low, covered projection of the wall. She was always in prayer, and appeared to be preparing herself for the sacrifice. I received at that moment an interior instruction as to how we should prepare for the holy sacrifice. I saw in her room myriads of angels adoring the child Jesus. Mary was wholly absorbed in her own interior. The old people did out of pure love all they could for the mother of God. They must have had some presentiment of the child's holiness. I had a vision also of the priest Simeon. He was a very aged, emaciated man with a short beard. He had a wife and three grown sons, the youngest of whom was already twenty years old. Simeon dwelt at the temple. I saw him going through a narrow, dark passage in the wall of the temple to a little cell which was built in the thick walls. It had only one opening, from which he could look down into the temple. Here I saw the old man kneeling and praying in ecstasy. The apparition of an angel appeared before him, telling him to notice particularly the first child that would early the next morning, be brought for presentation, for that it was the Messiah whom he had now awaited so long. The angel added that, after seeing the child, he would die. Oh, what a beautiful sight that was to me! The little cell was so bright, and the old man radiant with joy. He went home full of gladness, announced to his wife the good tidings of the angel, and then returned to his prayer. I have seen that the pious priests, and Israelites of those times did not sway to and fro so much when at prayer as the Jews of our days, but I saw them scourging themselves. Anna in her temple cell was also wrapped in prayer, and she, too, had a vision. Early in the morning while it was still quite dark, I saw the holy family accompanied by the two old people going into the city and to the temple. The ass was laden as if for a journey, and they had with them the basket of offerings. They first entered a court that was surrounded by a wall, and there the ass was tied under a shed. The blessed virgin and child were received by an old woman and conducted along a covered walk up to the temple. The old woman carried a light, for it was still dark. Here in this passage came Simeon full of expectation to meet Mary. He spoke a few joyous words with her, took the child Jesus, pressed him to his heart, and then hurried to another side of the temple. Since the preceding evening, when he had received the announcement of the angel, he had been consumed by desire. He had taken his stand in the women's passage to the temple, hardly able to await the coming of Mary and her child. Mary was now led by the woman to a porch in that part of the temple in which the ceremony of presentation was to take place. Anna and another woman, Noemi, Mary's former directress, received her. Simeon came out to the porch and conducted Mary with the child in her arms into the hall to the right of the women's porch. It was in this porch that the treasure box stood by which Jesus was sitting when the widow cast in her might. Old Anna, 
to whom Joseph had handed over the basket of fruit and doves, followed with Noemi, and Joseph retired to the standing place of the men. It was understood at the temple that several women were coming today to offer sacrifice, and preparations had been made accordingly. Numerous pyramidal lamps were burning round the walls, the little flames rising out of a disc supported upon an arm in the form of an arch, which shone almost as brightly as the light itself. On the disc hung extinguishers which, when struck together above the flame, put it out. Before the altar, from whose corners projected horns, was placed a chest, the doors of which opened outward and afforded supports for a tolerably large slab, the whole forming a table. This surface was covered first with a red cloth and over that a white transparent one, both of which fell to the floor. On the four corners burned lamps with several branches. In the center of the table was a cradle-shaped basket, and near it two oval dishes and two small baskets. All these objects, as also the priest's vestments, which were lying on the horned altar, were kept in the chest whose open doors formed the table. A railing enclosed the whole. On both sides of this hall were rows of seats and tiers where priests were sitting in prayer. Simeon conducted Mary through the altar rail and up to the table of sacrifice. The infant Jesus, wrapped in his sky-blue dress, was laid in the basket cradle. Mary wore a sky-blue dress, a white veil, and a long, yellowish mantle. When the child had been placed in the cradle, Simeon led Mary out again to the standing place of the women. He then proceeded to the altar proper, whereon laid the priestly vestments and at which, besides himself, three other priests were vesting. And now one of them went behind, one before, and two on either side of the table, and prayed over the child, while Anna approached Mary, gave her the doves and fruit in two little baskets, one on top of the other, and went with her to the altar rail. Anna remained there while Mary, led again by Simeon, passed on through the railing and up to the altar. Thereupon one of the dishes she deposited the fruit, and into the other laid some coins, the doves she placed upon the table in the basket. Simeon stood before the table near Mary while the priest behind it took the child from the cradle, raised it on high, and toward the different parts of the temple, praying all the while. Simeon next received the child from him, laid it in Mary's arms, and from a roll of parchment that lay near him on a desk, prayed over her and the child. After that Simeon again led Mary to the railing, whence Anna accompanied her to the place set apart for the women. In the meantime, about twenty mothers with their firstborn had arrived. Joseph and several others were standing back in the place assigned to the men. Then two priests at the altar proper began a religious service accompanied by incense and prayers, while those in the rows of seats swayed to and fro a little, but not like the Jews of the present day. When these ceremonies were ended, Simeon went to where Mary was standing, took the child into his arms and, entranced with joy, spoke long and loud. When he ceased, Anna also filled with the Spirit, spoke a long time. I saw that the people around heard them indeed, but it caused no interruption to the other ceremonies. Such praying aloud appeared not to be unusual. But all were deeply impressed, and regarded Mary and the child with great reverence. Mary shone like a rose. Her public offerings were indeed the poorest, but Joseph and private gave to Simeon and to Anna many little, yellow, triangular pieces to be employed for the use of the temple, and chiefly for the maidens belonging to it who were too poor to meet their own expenses. It was not everyone that could have his children reared in the temple. Once I saw a boy in Anna's care. I think he was the son of a prince, or king, but I have forgotten his name. I did not witness the purification ceremonies of the other mothers but I had an interior conviction that all the children offered on that day would receive special grace, and that some of the martyred innocents were among them. When the Most Holy Child Jesus was laid upon the altar in the basket cradle, an indescribable light filled the temple. I saw that God was in that light, and I saw the heavens open up as far as the Most Holy Trinity. Mary was now led back into the court by Anna and Noemi. Here she took leave of them, and was joined by Joseph and the old people with whom she and Joseph had lodged. They went with the ass straight out of Jerusalem, and the good, old people accompanied them a part of the way. 
They reached Bethra on the same day, and stayed overnight in the house which had been Mary's last stopping place on her journey to the temple thirteen years before. Here some of Anna's people were waiting to conduct them home. I saw the festival of the purification celebrated also in the spiritual church. It was filled with angelic choirs and in the center above them, I saw the Most Holy Trinity, and in it something like a void. In the middle of the church stood an altar and on it a tree with broad, pendant leaves, similar to the trees in paradise by which Adam fell. I saw the Blessed Virgin with the child Jesus in her arms floating up from the earth to the altar, while the tree on the same inclined low before her and began to wither. A magnificent angel in priestly garments, a halo round his head, approached Mary. She gave him the child, and he laid it upon the altar. At that instant I saw the Most Holy Trinity as ever before in its fullness. I saw the angel give to Mary a little shining ball whereon was the figure of a swathed child, and I saw her with this gift hovering over the altar. From all sides I saw crowds of poor people approaching Mary with lights. She reached those lights to the child on the ball into which they seemed to pass, and then to reappear. I saw that all these lights united into one, which spread over Mary and the child, and illumined all things. Mary had extended her wide mantle over the whole earth. And now there was a festival. I think that the withering of the tree of knowledge at Mary's appearance, and the offering of the child to the Most Holy Trinity signified the reuniting of the human race with God, and through Mary those scattered lights became one light in the light of Jesus, and illumined all things. I saw that Simeon, after prophesying in the temple, returned home and fell sick. I saw him on his couch giving his last advice to his wife and sons, and imparting to them his joy. Then I saw him die. There were several old Jews and priests praying around him. When he had breathed his last, they carried the body into another room where, without stripping it, it was washed. The body was laid on a board pierced with holes, under which was a copper basin to receive the water as it fell. A large sheet was thrown over the corpse, and under that the washing was performed. Green leaves and herbs were then strewn plentifully over it, and a wide cloth bound firmly around it, as is done in the swathing of a child. The corpse was so stiff and straight that I was tempted to think it was bound to a board. The burial took place in the evening. Six men with lights carried the corpse on a board with low, curved sides to the sepulchre hewn in a hill not far from the temple. It was entered through an oblique door. The interior walls were ornamented with stars and various figures like the Blessed Virgin's cell at the temple. I noticed the same kind of ornamentation in St. Benedict's first cloister. The corpse was deposited in the center of the little cave, the passage around it being left free, then some religious rites were solemnized. They laid all kinds of things around the corpse, coins and little stones and leaves, I think. I do not now remember all distinctly. Simeon was related to Veronica and through his father, with Zachary also. His sons served in the temple, and were always, though in secret, on terms of friendship with Jesus and his relatives. Some of them before and some after the ascension of our Lord joined the disciples. At the time of the first persecution they did much for the community. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now, and at the hour of death. Amen.